companies or uh, bus companies all over Europe with over a thousand buses and um, almost the same number of employees. And uh, with these employees, we do not talk about drivers. So there, in addition, we talk about almost 5,200 drivers who on a daily basis safely bring you to whatever destination you want. And in terms of destinations, well, it's over a thousand destinations. Actually, it's 1,200 cities you can reach with the green buses. And that sums up to um, 150,000 uh, daily connections throughout Europe. And um, from the start, which was in February 2013 until today, we have managed to transport around 70 million people. And the business itself is being managed out of six offices, two in Germany, one in uh, France, uh, uh, Italy, and uh, in Zagreb and Stockholm and another two offices in Prague and in Amsterdam will follow this year. So why could that all start it? Basically, one thing was, which was super important for us is that in Europe, mainly only trains or sometimes planes, but large governmental owned companies provided mobility and they basically never asked us, they just came up with something. In parallel, the younger generation is not as keen as the older ones to own a car, but it's much more important, for instance, to own an iPad or an iPhone or any other cool digital device. And in parallel, the need to travel to see things increased. So much more people travel right now and, and really enjoy the freedom of Europe and the European Union. Um, and therefore, there was a need for some more additional way of traveling, which potentially is cheaper and sometimes maybe even a little bit more innovative or smart, as we say. And on top of that, the cool thing about the modern buses is per head, you just create less carbon dioxide than with any other long distance mobility. And all those put together was a little bit the starting fundament how we uh, could have started that success. Beside these factors, a good question would be why was there no Flixbus or different company before? And one of the reasons is in long distance, you usually have very high invests. So buses or even more expensive trains or planes are super high in terms of invest. And therefore, most of those companies were originally governmental owned and we basically paid for their starting assets. Also, as I briefly mentioned already, mainly, especially in public transportation, we as customers, we never had been asked whether we want to go from A to B or what is our demand. Basically, cities or states or whoever from the government side just put traffic into place, not really taking into consideration if it's needed or not. Therefore, there is many empty stuff also, especially running around within cities. And on top of that, well, the internet. Um, we consider ourselves partly a mobility company and also partly a tech company. And therefore the internet was also very crucial for our success because in the past time, if you would have started a company, the challenge to, to make that brand known out there, well, quite a bit, TV commercials or any other super expensive marketing efforts, now with a competable price, people just look up the internet, what is the best option from, 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 for them to, to travel from A to B, and there in these kind of transparency and comparison, um, the bus just showed up and helped us uh, to grow. We're basically not the first one who do these kind of platform approaches. I guess one of the most prominent examples um, is Uber in the US, Major difference is we follow the laws though, but basically from a tech perspective, it's very, very similar. Those platform approaches mainly started in the inner city because there is not so much asset you need to buy and it's, well, with taxis or even with private cars, it's more common that people have those around and you can pull them already. In the long and mid distance uh, uh, segment, there, as said, mainly formerly governmental owned companies or still, and almost only about railways and, 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 and uh, 
uh, air airplanes and nothing in in the in the um, in the sector of cheap long distance transportation and i guess we could not even have started if the european union didn't force uh, the european governments in the countries like germany austria and and, and france and the others to liberalize the long distance market so private competitors like us could have started the model itself is well it's a partnership Flixbus itself is responsible for the planning of the routes and the timetable. So really focusing on the demand of the people and come up with proper uh, timetables. Obviously, we're also responsible for the marketing and the sales parts so of bringing people into the buses. And there most of the tech, I'll talk later about a little, comes into place, which is sell our tickets through multi different uh, channels. And last but not least, we take care about the operation. So it's about traffic control, always knowing where the buses are, uh, taking care about delays, and also obviously taking care about um, any customer request which comes up you either before or maybe also after, um, after the ride. And that has been done with 250 bus partners. Um, two of the largest ones we actually have here in Austria, Blagos and Dr. Richard, but there are many others. And they all um, own the buses and also employ the drivers, which as I said already is a little bit above 5,000, who on a daily basis um, just transport the Flixbus customers. One interesting number is, in terms of the growth, that we in 2015 reached at the first time a magical number, which is 60 million passengers on an annual basis, which in Germany is the annual, uh, the annual domestic uh, passenger number for flight transportation. And uh, therefore, we truly believe the bus is a good alternative. And as you see here, um, until now, we don't see any limit. When it started still, it was not that nobody around was challenging us or we were alone. We basically felt a little bit like that small and tiny guy and had quite some competitors, which were comparably fat out there. And yes, I would not say we were afraid, but cautious. And we realized over time, it doesn't really matter how how much weight you gained over time. It only matters how fast you are. And therefore, being a little tiny in the beginning is in my point of view uh, a great benefit because you just really can pass by those large fat dudes. When it started, it looked like that. And back then, the only investment and in tech thing we had was th that printer, which was incredibly important because you see on the wall our first timetable and we, we couldn't manage to do that with pen and paper, so we at least had Excel in that printer. And uh, the real tech thing, the first real tech thing we started up with was how we came up with that first schedule. Because we basically had no clue about bus traveling. And the only thing we know, or we knew, was since there was no buses in Europe, we had carpooling or currently blah blah cars there. And obviously, there is demand and there is offer. And the offer is very transparent because you can click there and see wherever people run and can hop on their cars. And what we did is I came up with some scraper thingy and scraped their website and just saw, okay, where offer is, potentially there's also demand. And that was the first piece of tech where uh, our first, uh, our first uh, timetable was based on. When we started, we were three founders and the two other guys were our interns. Fun fact is, in those 10 square meters, it's very easy to do and to, to solve things, to talk about visions and strategy, because if something doesn't work, you just slap the other one. And also, if you want to hit the bathroom, you better make up your mind a little bit in advance, because that was very similar to Tetris. And over time, well, from a few lines with 30 buses in 2013, we covered basically Germany um, in, in, in 2015 and became the market leader. And meanwhile, it's 22, com uh, 22 countries. And from August on, I, I suppose we'll also be the largest uh, uh, bus transportation company here in, in Austria. And that was more or less the easy part because it is totally based on the demand of the customers. The challenging part and uh, how, we, how we mastered that is the organizational growth. Because as I said, five people, easy. 
Thousand people, six offices, well, not that easy. And over time, it's not as said that we, we just could grow and trial and error for every, uh, like always. We had to also tackle some competitors on the way. And all of those were like sumo ringers. And uh, in Germany, the interesting part was, well, Postbus started because they thought people are very similar to luggage. It's just self-loading luggage, so to say, self-loading parcels. And that's when they started. And there's one mistake I want to share. They talked to us and wanted, uh, wanted our team to work for them very, uh, very, very, uh, in the very beginning. We had a talk in Frankfurt and where we really focused on our app and talked to the customers what they want, they wanted to convince us to, to sell tickets in the post stops first. And we just couldn't agree on that. And on the way back, we realized that they didn't even save their URLs, their domains. And five minutes later, someone else, in that case, my grandpa, rest in peace, uh, took care about their domains. And um, after a while, they had to delay their start. And, and we basically had to sell that back. And what that example shows is, again, if you're fast and a little bit more innovative and future oriented, there is no, there is no reason to, to be afraid of, of large players. With Stagecoach, the brand had been called Megabus. It was very similar. They wanted to take us over and didn't want to pay anything because we had no bu buses in our PL. Well, we couldn't agree. Two years later, they almost, they, 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 they summed up almost 30 million of losses and came back. And uh, then we were in the driver's seat and uh, I couldn't actually pay too much for them because they had much buses and no single engineer in their PL. And also there, the approach was just different. And talking about the approach, two things from the outside perspective, what is super important and what we try to continuously do right, is A, that we took a more or less old kind of thing. Buses are there forever, everybody knows that. They had a bad image though, because everybody who remembers being on a bus either remembers getting beaten up on the way to school or potentially Grandma brought home some heating blanket or anything, nothing needed, wasn't sexy. And uh, surrounding the product, how we came up with, hey, having Wi-Fi on the buses or, uh, uh, or, or power blocks, it was all about asking the customer. So the customer and having a close connection is crucial and you do not want to lose that because that's the only reason why companies exist is the customer. And we try to heavily invest um, and have a high NPS in our case. And not only because we think that's uh, crucial for a sustainable business, but also it's a cost, cost decision. Since if people like you and come back on themselves, you do not have to rebuy them any other day on Google. And the second, res uh, the second important pillar of, of uh, the business model and the company's success is technology. So. With those 1,000 people, for instance, we have over 150 software engineers, which comparably to other transportation companies is quite a lot. And the reason is that we decided the core things, what is close to our value proposition, we better do that ourselves because we know it better. We talk to our customers rather than having third-party players or anybody develop anything for us. And therefore, meanwhile, it is so to say, a platform which does not only take care about selling the ticket, but also coming up with the proper schedules and plans, just gathering certain traffic flows, knows what, uh, I don't know, holiday schedules are, uh, schedules are out there, and tries to understand where people travel. And it's the same on the pricing side. There is some kind of self-learning uh, algorithm in place which just gathers the competi competition data, um, any any holidays again, weather data, anything to come up with a proper pricing and controls and steers it over uh, the matter of time and, and the load factor of the buses. And that goes on and on in terms of operations with a thousand buses, it's one of the largest uh, fleets to be controlled simultaneously and you just have to manage that in terms of, well, are buses delayed, are they on track, are they, are they running well or do, do they need maintenance and all that basically, well, you can do that manually, but we try 
to do that in technology. And the interesting part is, if you once reach a certain level, I suppose it's much easier to internationalize because the core concept stays the same. And for us, it's also much easier to, for instance, come up with an additional business. We meanwhile charter buses so people can just rent buses over the weekend or whatever because we gathered so much information that we can guess the price, what it has to cost, and can let the customers buy the buses even though we do not have arranged it. So it's a little bit like a stock uh, a marketplace. And then, well, why always stay with buses? If having everything together, you obviously can also serve other vehicles, trains or whatever is down there on a long distance road perspective. So tech is crucial, but tech doesn't do it by itself. When it started, it was easy. We had to do that MVP approach. And the reason why, because it was only myself and two other people. And uh, what we learned is you, you have to stick with that. We still put things out there where I personally, I'm embarrassed sometimes, but it doesn't matter because together with the customers, you continuously work on that. And time to market and speed is the only thing what matters. And only because I can potentially now, because having uh, 150 people, I maybe can just do not follow that MVP road, uh, approach anymore. It is super important to stay with that. And um, it's not only about reading those article articles about Steve Jobs or, or, or uh, Jeff Bezos. I personally can say, well, those guys are right. Maybe that's the reason why they're so successful. You better stick with that approach. And that's part of the culture. If, if you just do not and try to double check everything and, 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 and really test everything three, four, a thousand times, you just get slow. And the reason why that MVP approach has to work and is so successful these days is basically that our world got so complex. Complicated stuff. For instance, super complicated would be building a rocket flying to Mool. Yes, complicated, but yeah, potentially you can write a manual. We did that as humans already a couple times. But there are other things who have so much external influencers that you cannot predict how it happens. And that is getting m just more and more because information is rising. Um, there are so many people who influence uh, you and your company. It, it doesn't make sense to come up with a manual how to build a certain piece of software. And therefore, quite for a while, agile principles came up in software engineering. We follow them, not only in software, but overall in the company. And a good example where you see how iteration works very well is Formula One. If you see how pit stops worked like 20 years ago and how they work now, nobody read, uh, nobody wrote in manual uh, or read it afterwards. They just tried an error and it meanwhile takes a second or whatever, whereas it took uh, almost half a minute 20 years ago. In detail, to work agile, there is something needed, something which is different in my point of view and also has to be part of the culture than former times. It is about information and it is about certain small steps and putting that information together to come up with a cool product or service. And that needs trust because I, I don't know anything. Obviously, our thousand people are closer to the customer and know much more than I do personally. So I have to trust them. And, well, trusting means I cannot always prove whether they do right or wrong. And I have to, by, for instance, um, taking the right people on the bus, hiring, I really need uh, intuition because also there you cannot really test everything. And you need context because there's so much information. If you're overwhelmed, you potentially get not the right things out of that. So context is needed. And that points to not only technology. Yes, that is potentially the fundament of many successful businesses. But without people and proper leadership who puts technology people together, it doesn't work. And that is so much different these days than it, it had been in former days and also what I have 
seen at Siemens or Microsoft or other companies. Um, it's about how you lead and how people can work towards a certain goal. And there, the Flixbus methodology or something how we think organizations should work um, comes in. Peter Drucker, 1919, said the, the rules of productivity. Everybody knows that, I guess. Productivity is output through input. Well, divided by input. And the reason why that is not valid anymore is basically when we talked about productivity in the past time, it's, it was only by increasing speed or, or having just more, uh, more output. or it's, it's a little bit like how you manufacture a car. And that is, in this context, uh, we were acting in different because then it's about having the information and creating with technology and people knowledge out of that information. And obviously that works, well, it can be accelerated with even more technology in terms of automation. So all that self-organizational part, what I'll come to in a minute, is not that we do that only because we love Agile or love the people. It's the reason that we think that's the most successful way um, to, to, to create good products and, and, and services and a successful company. And yeah. Um, just a fun fact, of course, things we have to deal with today are there because of a certain way of thinking. And if we want our, to solve our future problems, we potentially have to think different, have to lead different, have to act different. And maybe it's not only about the top management, maybe it's about having a structure where everybody can contribute properly. In IT, that means that, well, I have 150 people and we have to, to operate profitable. It's not like maybe a US company can do and can just burn hundreds of millions. That's not how it works in Europe, I suppose. We have to uh, act properly, uh, profitable and therefore efficiency and, and complexity is a challenge and, and it gets more and more expensive and more people work on it. That has to be dealt with. If you grow, it's not that you can just do what you want. There are people asking, hey, uh, do you follow certain rules? There are uh, certain accounting challenges. You have annual reporting, all that stuff. Um, because it basically, it scales and also the demands from the outside scale. And if it grows, usually you find yourself at a certain point, and in that example in tech, having different departments. Could be front end, back end, operations, could be uh, certain technologies, you have Java people, PHP people, again, <laughs> operations people around. But that is not united. So it's not that a group of people or an individual can take over accountability because he's only responsible for a part of it. Well, and the reason is it's quite normal. If you as a founder, if I as a founder, well, we thought we were cleverer than everybody else, and there is a, a syndrome called hippo syndrome, highest, highest paid person's opinion. It's like, it works for a while, but at the end, too much information has said it, it, it cannot continue like that. And uh, therefore, we worked on empowering the whole organization to mainly work more on their own, taking, uh, taking uh, over more accountability and taking over the responsibility for, for their decision and not only on my decision. And a good example of how that self-organization can be copied from, from the outside, are uh, animals, like mackerels. Um, because, well, a single mackerel potentially cannot understand the situation if there is whatever, a shark or anything. In total, one of them potentially realizes and then they can act. And um, somehow they manage, even though there is no leader, to stay in sync. So it just works because they do that for thousands of millions of years already. And um, they just do that in that situation in order to protect themselves or for any other reason. But there is no manager, no founder, nobody who tells the mackerels, well, you have to do so or you don't do that better. And um, it works. 
And I guess if nature does that for thousands of years, why should it always be a hierarchy, especially in that complex world with, uh, with, uh, with all those informations? So we just translated that to, to our, our company and uh, had, have created certain roles, which are common in the agile world, but not necessarily in the rest of the business world. And uh, those roles are responsible for the individual parts um, of self-organization, might it be purpose, talking about what we want to do, what is the vision, and, and uh, empowering people, um, trying to support the autonomy so that the processes work, that people are independent from, from other people, that it just it runs smoothly, basically. And people who are totally independent, who take care about certain mastery of, of, of careers and things like that. So it cannot be only the boss anymore to decide whether he likes this nose better than that nose, but independent people who just make sure that we work together with the right people and those people can develop themselves. And at the end, when we transformed that towards self-organization, we were discussing how how to do so. We didn't have the time like the mackerels for, uh, for thousands of years. We just wanted to change that now because over time we had built some, some hierarchy and, and uh, we, we from, from like end of 2015 on we realized well it, it gets slower and what we did um, well we just asked the people. We just brought 150 people together, had a couple rules not many and asked hey what do you want to do? What role do you want to have? In what team do you want to work? What product do you want to do? And uh, basically we came up with some, some game, more or less. And guess what? Even though I wasn't sure, it works. And the throughput in technology of our Agile teams, what they develop, increased by almost 20%. Just because they choose whatever they wanted to and not, not, my, not me. And that is, in terms of organizational patterns, something we see very successful. And uh, the fun fact is, it even released a little bit of myself for certain decisions and, and, and uh, certain things to do. That is an organizational concept which, at least in our environment, as said, complex, very informational driven, is very successful. And the uh, good thing is, it also increased. Uh, not only customer happiness but also employee happiness. That's the one part what, uh, what we just came up with over time by combining our learnings and just really not only testing it out but taking the whole organization and just changing it. Any other things which from day one until now is important is the culture itself because the culture is in every individual and the culture is something which could only make these kind of changes to the organization happen. And that's easy stuff everybody has heard already. But I only can say we have to remind ourselves and every, every other day that it is about trial and error. If we don't try anything, if there is no risk, you will not succeed. And even on an individual basis, uh, if you uh, think about what to do with your savings, well, yes, you can bring it just to your bank or you can uh, buy stocks. Obviously, stocks are more risky, but at the banks nowadays, you don't get anything. Also, nothing new. Everybody at Flixbus can come up with an idea, gets the resources, and the worst thing what can happen, even though it's an intern, is that he or she has to take care and just take that project and, and, and try to succeed. Because, well, if there is an error, nothing happens. What you should avoid, though, is doing errors twice, three times, or even more, because that can consider it a little bit stupid. Um, I mean, it's, it's all about, well, yeah, take it into consideration. It will fail, but just make sure to really take remarks how to do it better next time and not think about in advance how to avoid the risks taking them into consideration, take into consideration they will uh, get uh, something wrong, come to that in a second, and just take all the information, everything you've learned, and, and, and think about more how you can change it, how you can iterate, how you can, ha can do better. Well, and at the end I said already, 
Um, what will go wrong goes wrong. Murphy's law. Just it is like that. And the fun fact is, I didn't, I couldn't even find a toast w with jam on both sides because that's the ugly truth. Only if it just lands on the sides, it's good. It never does. And um, if you plan with that, it's fine. You just get up again, put your crown back on on your head, and run faster than before. These things were quite challenging to maintain over time in every new individual. But these things are important because the culture is the only thing what makes us different and is the foundation for these kind of organizational experiments. Um, and um, if, you, if you sum that up, we just, beside the organizational pattern we're now following, came up with uh, five values, which is for everybody to live some internal spirit and that's not only a saying as I said it, it's about giving people responsibility they have to be able to decide and it's about bring passion that's an old one initially I guess we came up with that because when we were young we couldn't pay properly and uh, meanwhile that works but it cannot be only about money it has to be about the passion it has to be people really seeing how e they influence other people's life uh, how, how they make new ways of traveling work and not just coming to, to, to work only because, meanwhile, there is a decent pay. And that one is one of the most important ones for believing and really executing that uh, organizational pattern that we were successful with. We are a team. And if you only state, hey, we are a team, we are a team, but anyhow, um, we can do Agile as long as you do how I say, and we are a team as long as I say what direction we go, fine. But if you truly are a team, well, you realize that you only can succeed together and it's n my head is not larger and that much more, uh, much more clever than others. And consider myself as part of the team. And if everybody does, then you can uh, uh, play around with any organizational pattern and also um, have, have the chance that self-organization works. Make it happen, also classic. But usually over time, as I said already, people tend to make plans more or uh, try to avoid Pareto with 80-20 or, um, well, do things to plan. And the challenge is, during the phase of planning, other people, well, they act already. They hit the market already. So it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to over plan things. Make it happen. Basically, in most of our jobs, not all, most of our jobs, tech, Flixbus, my job for instance, if I do wrong, nobody will die. Well, yes, driver potentially should look like how the bus works and double check everything, fine. But in many of our modern tech uh, information workers jobs, well, nobody will die. And therefore I can just make things happen. And the, o the last but not least, the most important, the overall most important thing is customer first. Customer first. If not, companies will fail. And my current part as being part of that large self-organizing uh, self organization where basically there are no real hierarchy and bosses anymore. If I have to decide things where I have no idea of, the only, uh, the only reasons, uh, the, only, the only questions I, I ask is, well, why do we do so? Maybe just in general to understand, what does it bring the customer? Is there any value? What does it bring the customer? And at the end, if that is all very common, I also tend to ask, what does it bring us as a company? Because somehow you also have to, to earn some money. But it's more about asking and, and s just putting the customer in the middle. Um, because I truly believe if this is the case, well, it will be honored by having more and more customers and therefore being successful. And what we do is we continue like that. We just will continue to grow. And uh, for this year, mainly in Europe, but we believe there are other continents out there who also deserve uh, cool green buses. And we reached a certain level with a thousand employees where it is challenging, but with the, the organizational patterns we chose, we are very confident that it doesn't really matter how many uh, offices we'll have in the future, how large we'll get in the future. 
we think we are well prepared uh, with with that pattern and our and our values, and we also believe that this is uh, the core of the success and where, for instance, also cool technology could uh, could uh, be built up on, um, because all the other things are basically only tools. It's about the culture and the organization, whether you be successful or no. Thanks. And since we have a couple minutes left, potentially there is questions to be asked. If so, maybe, I don't know if there is a micro, if not, you just scream at me or shout at my... Ah, oh. Jetzt brauche ich auch noch so... Aber ich habe, das geht ja auch nicht, weil dann höre ich es nicht. So question was what other destinations uh, we'll plan in the future. For this year, beside Austria, uh, Austrians potentially have read that in the news, beside Austria, um, Southeastern Europe will be, um, uh, will be uh, heavily targeted in terms of growth. So most of the large cities uh, uh, in the former Yugoslavia, but also up north towards Poland uh, will be included in the network. We also started uh, services towards Portugal and Spain, only cross-border though, because Spain is not liberalized yet. And another uh, main focus will be Scandinavia, so that the goal um, is by the end of the year to kind of have covered everything in Central Europe or slash the European Union. And then we'll see. You must be in the first time, because I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So two questions. First one is, if we do anything to improve the product, and yes, we do. Um, it's not only on us, but yeah, potentially what we've come up with was good if only 10 people were in the buses. Now it's 80. Doesn't work so well anymore. We uh, have signed uh, uh, contracts with Telecom A1 and all the large providers to increase the, the general capacity. So it's there's more more to surf, uh, to surf out with. And also, we are currently testing with uh, three new providers whether we need to have better hardware than uh, which is currently uh, in the buses. And the rollout project will start in July, as far as I know. And therefore, we uh, believe in having uh, an uh, increasingly better, better Wi-Fi coverage um, um, over, over or until the, the end of the year. Second question was, well, Uber didn't wait until somebody liberalized any market. They just came. The challenge is um, that if we would have started without any uh, deregulation, no city would have let us stop somewhere. It's like Uber is usually the thing which is not allowed is running around, you just call it Uber, it comes. It doesn't work like that, obviously, in the buses because you need a certain utilization, so you need to have stops. And uh, stops is one of the things which are still regulated, but at least we can talk to cities or whoever owns the stops. They would not, never have granted, um, granted us. Also, Uber in Germany, for instance, well, the taxi lobby, okay, but not as powerful as Deutsche Bahn, as one single competitor. If we just would have run, they ch I suppose they would have raised any, any legal claim within minutes as they did already when Dynbus originally as the first uh, long distance bus operator started the business and they didn't even do a scheduled service that was like Mitfahrgelegenheit, blah blah car for buses. They waited until the bus was full and ran then. And they just, uh, it, it didn't take a week uh, when, they, when they got sued. And th the challenge which we also still have is somehow if it's a large thing driving around, the government takes care more. Our buses are ultra regularly checked and not only uh, for if we transport cool cannabis stuff uh, but also um, if the concessions are on the board the original concessions no copies it has to be sealed blah 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 if not they pull you over and it takes forever 
and they just they just really uh, uh, they get just really get rid uh, uh, they get to really influence your operational service, which again influences your customer satisfaction, and therefore I guess our business model would not have worked because it's so it's it's so singular rather than having many little drivers and uh, and now in Germany better Uber uh, should have waited also because what they really do well is not allowed at least not in Germany right now. And now I got the signal I have to jump uh, off the stage. If not, she'll just tackle me down. <laughs>